In the depths of Little Dismal Sink, three seasoned divers set out on a daring mission to explore and map the unknown. Their goal, to uncover hidden passages beneath the Earth's surface. But what started as an ambitious adventure quickly turned into a harrowing fight for survival. One diver met a mysterious and tragic fate that will leave you on the edge of your seat. In this video, we'll uncover the chilling details of what happened to one of the three brave explorers. The Leon Sinks Geological Area is found in southern and southwestern Leon County, Florida, USA. It is located on the Woodville Karst Plain, a region known for its unique geological features. This area has a mature karst system, which means it has many sinkholes, caves, and underground rivers. These features are part of the Upper Floridan Aquifer, an important source of water. The Leon Sinks area has one of the largest underwater cave systems in the world. These caves connect to Wakula Springs, a large natural spring nearby. Because the rocks in this area are very permeable, meaning water can easily pass through them, the aquifer is very vulnerable to pollution. Anything harmful that gets into the ground can quickly spread through the water system. To protect and understand this delicate system, a group called the Woodville Karst Plain Project has done a lot of mapping and exploration of the caves. They are studying how water moves through the area and how to keep the water clean. This work is important because the water in these caves is a crucial resource for the local environment and people. The Leon Sinks are home to many forms of life. For example, you can find freshwater eels and rare types of crustaceans, which are small, shrimp-like creatures. Some of these crustaceans are unique to this area, like the Woodville Karst Plain Crayfish and the Swimming Florida Cave Isopod, known scientifically as Remicellus parvus. These creatures only live in the Woodville Karst Plain, making the area very special and important for biodiversity. Wakula Cave is a large underwater cave system made up of many branching tunnels. So far, 19 kilometers of these tunnels have been surveyed and mapped. The tunnels are like long tubes with a consistent width and depth, usually about 300 feet deep. Sometimes, these tubes are separated by larger chambers of different shapes and sizes. The biggest tunnel goes south from the entrance of the spring and cave for more than 6.1 kilometers. There are also four smaller tunnels, including the one leading to Leon Sinks, which connect to this main tunnel. Most of these smaller tunnels have been fully explored. On December 15, 2007, members of the Woodville Karst Plain Project discovered a connection between the Wakula Cave System and the Leon Sinks Cave System. This connection created the Wakula Leon Sinks Cave System. With this connection, it became the longest underwater cave in the United States and the sixth largest in the world, with a total of 51.48 kilometers of mapped passages. Many of the sinkholes in the Leon Sinks geological area are linked through underwater caves. In May 1988, a group of divers were mapping the Little Dismal Sink in Leon County, Florida. This group included three separate teams that were all in the cave at the same time. The divers that day were some of the best and most respected divers of the time, like Parker Turner, Bill Gavin, Bill Main, and others. Their main goal was to collect geological data and survey data for the last part of the upstream and downstream tunnels of the deep section. The deep section is the deepest part of the cave, as its name suggests. To get to this deep section, a diver must enter the sink and navigate through several very narrow passages. First, a diver enters the peanut room, which is the first room in the cave. After the peanut room, they move on to the second room. Once they pass the second room, the divers can reach the fourth room by going through either the third room or a narrow shortcut that connects the second room directly to the fourth room. Finally, the fifth room is where the upper passage ends. The divers had to be very careful while navigating these rooms because the passages between them were extremely tight and challenging. The work they were doing was important because it helped to create detailed maps and gather valuable information about the cave's structure. This data was crucial for understanding the cave better and ensuring the safety of future explorations. At that time, the upper part of the cave, where the first few rooms are located, was well explored. The first part of the cave was about 700 feet long and went down to a depth of 150 feet at its deepest point. In the fifth room, called the well, there was a hole in the floor. This hole led to a nearly straight down shaft. The divers would go down this shaft to reach a depth of 170 feet. This brought them into the sixth room, which is part of the deeper section of the cave. The deep section has three main parts, the sixth room, the deep upstream tunnel, and the deep downstream tunnel. The deep upstream tunnel goes down to a depth of 220 feet. This was the depth the divers aimed to reach and work at during this particular dive. This part of the cave was important to explore because it helped the divers understand more about the cave's structure and gather crucial data for future dives. 
Diving to a depth of 220 feet for long periods requires special training and certifications in technical diving. Divers need a strong understanding of decompression diving and must use specialized equipment. One important piece of equipment for deep dives is a dry suit. A dry suit is a waterproof suit that keeps a layer of air inside to protect the diver from cold water at deep depths. As a diver goes deeper, the water pressure increases, which squeezes the dry suit and the air pocket inside it. To prevent the suit from becoming too tight, the diver needs to add more air from their cylinders as they go deeper. When a diver is at their deepest point, their dry suit has the most air in it. However, this creates a challenge when they start to ascend. As the diver goes up, the pressure outside the suit decreases, causing the air inside the suit to expand. This expansion increases the diver's buoyancy, which means they could start to float up too quickly. To avoid this, the diver must release some air through a vent valve on the suit. The dry suit helps the diver control their buoyancy. It's very important for the diver to know how much air is in their suit and how it affects their buoyancy as they ascend. Losing control of their buoyancy, especially while cave diving, can be very dangerous and could lead to a life or death situation. On May 15, 1988, the divers put on their gear and entered the little dismal sink. As they entered the first room, they followed their plan and separated into different teams. Parker Turner and Shirley Bailey stayed in the first room. Their task was to collect rock samples from this area. Meanwhile, Bill McFadden, Bill Main, and Bill Gavin moved deeper into the cave. They first went to the fifth room. From there, they went through the vertical shaft that led to the sixth room and the lower section of the cave. This is the point where they split up to continue their tasks in different parts of the cave. Bill Gavin was very experienced and knowledgeable. He decided to go into the downstream tunnel alone. He was famous for his deep diving skill and expertise. Bill Gavin worked as a U.S. naval engineer and had lots of experience with both deep sea and cave diving. He created a special device called the Gavin Scooter. This device helps divers travel further and move better underwater. This scooter, with changes and improvements over time, allowed cave divers to cover greater distances and move more easily underwater. William Hogarth M., also known as Bill Main, was another pioneer in cave diving. He developed the Hogarthian gear configuration, which is used in the Do It Right, DIR approach to scuba diving. This method became very popular and well known. Both Maine and Bill Gavin, as well as other divers from the Woodville Karst Plain Project, WKPP, used this method to explore and map cave systems. The WKPP's mission was to map underwater caves from Tallahassee, Florida, all the way to the Gulf of Mexico. This included famous places like Wakula Springs and Leon Sinks, the largest underwater cave system in the United States. Maine and Gavin were extremely experienced divers. They were well prepared for the challenging task of exploring and mapping these complex underwater cave systems. The Hogarthian method that Maine developed helped make their dives safer and more efficient. The third diver in the group was Bill McFadden, who was going to survey the deep section of the cave. He was 32 years old only, but had a lot of experience in diving. He lived in Tallahassee and had done 40 dives in Dismal Springs, including 15 deep dives. McFadden was also well known for his skills in cave mapping. He had a special talent for creating accurate maps based on his mental image of the inside of a cave. His ability to transform what he saw in his mind into detailed maps was highly regarded. Gavin, Maine, and McFadden were chosen for this dive because of their skills and experience. Gavin and Maine had many years of diving experience, and McFadden knew the local area well and was great at making maps. Together, their combined talents made the team confident that their dive to survey the deep section would be successful. Bill Gavin left the sixth room and went into the downstream tunnel to survey that area by himself. Bill Maine and Bill McFadden started into the upstream tunnel. Maine led the way, slowly moving forward through the tunnel. He tied the guideline as he went, while McFadden followed behind. McFadden stayed close to the line, using a compass to keep his direction and making notes on his survey slate. He was trying to navigate the tunnel, handle his compass, and take notes at the same time. This made things tricky, and his equipment got tangled with the line twice. First, McFadden's battery got caught in the line. He couldn't untangle it by himself, so Maine had to come back and help him release the battery from the line. Next, McFadden's safety reel got tangled. This problem was fixed quickly, but both incidents slowed their progress. The condition of the tunnel also made it hard to move fast. The tunnel was narrow and difficult to navigate, which made their progress even slower. The upstream tunnel had a low ceiling in some places, only about three feet high, and the floor was covered with a lot of silt. This was not ideal for surveying because if the divers disturbed the silt, it could reduce visibility to zero, making it impossible to see or do their work. 
So they had to move very slowly and be extremely careful not to kick up the silt. Even though the conditions were difficult, Bill Main and Bill McFadden managed to successfully map a large area of the upstream tunnel. They worked carefully to avoid disturbing the silt, which allowed them to see what they were doing and take accurate notes. Eventually, their gas supply started to get low, and Maine signaled that it was time to go back. Overall, even though they had to move slowly, the dive was a success. They gathered a lot of useful information and mapped a significant part of the tunnel. On the way back from their survey in the upstream tunnel, Bill Maine led the way using the guideline he had set earlier. Bill McFadden followed behind, making sure to avoid disturbing the silt, which could be dangerous if it obscured their vision or caused them to lose the guideline. Throughout their way back, they remained careful about not kicking up silt. Losing sight of the guideline could lead to serious problems, so they moved slowly and carefully. At times, McFadden stopped to update his notes and survey the surroundings. Maine waited patiently until McFadden was ready to continue, ensuring they stayed together. As they approach the sixth room, they start moving fast. Occasionally, despite their efforts, they accidentally kick up some silt. When this happened, Maine stopped and looked back to ensure McFadden was Neeby. When the water was clear, they could see the guideline clearly, which Maine had attached earlier. This guideline served as their lifeline, leading them directly back to the sixth room. After kicking up silt a few times, the water became very murky and visibility became very low in parts of the tunnel. This happened before they reached the exit, so they couldn't see anything. Maine went through the murky water and reached the clear, dark water of the sixth room. He waited there for McFadden, but he didn't show up. However, as time passed, Maine grew concerned. He realized that McFadden should have already exited the tunnel. Maine decided to swim back into the tunnel to look for him. Just then, he noticed a light coming from behind him. It was Bill Gavin, who had finished surveying the downstream tunnel and was heading towards the exit shaft in the sixth room. Maine quickly swam to Gavin and told him that McFadden was still in the upstream tunnel and was supposed to have come out already. They needed to act quickly to find McFadden and make sure he was safe. Immediately, Gavin swam into the upstream tunnel. As he entered, he encountered the area where the silt had been kicked up, causing the water to be pitch black with zero visibility. He relied on the guideline to guide him, but also used his hands to feel around as much as possible. Suddenly, the silt cleared, and Gavin found himself in an area with much better visibility. There, he discovered McFadden. McFadden was off from the guideline, but was unharmed. Gavin quickly reached out to McFadden and guided him back to the guideline. Together, Gavin and McFadden swam back along the guideline towards the sixth room where Maine was waiting just outside the tunnel. When they arrived, everyone took a moment to catch their breath and ensure that everyone was all right. Thankfully, McFadden was safe. However, their air supply was running low. They had used up valuable time searching for McFadden. It was crucial for them to return as quickly as possible. They knew they were running out of time and needed to make every second count. At this point, they realized they were going to be very close to using up all their air. They made their way towards the shaft leading to the bottom of the fifth room, known as the well. There, Gavin attached himself to the dive propulsion vehicle, DPV. Without it, their chances of getting out of the cave were very low. Hooking up to the DPV was crucial for their escape plan. As they got ready to leave, McFadden signaled to Gavin that he was out of air. Gavin quickly gave McFadden his long air hose to share his air. Now, both Gavin and McFadden were breathing from Gavin's air supply. Gavin started the DPV and they began speeding up towards the fifth room. While they were going up, they had to release air from their dry suits to control how high they floated. Moving through the fifth room with the DPV, Gavin and McFadden both depended on Gavin's air because McFadden had used up all of his own. Maine was using his air up fast, even though they were moving quickly with the DPV. As they went up, they were running out of time. Gavin let air out of his dry suit to avoid floating too much, but it didn't help much. McFadden, holding onto Gavin's manifold, lost control of his suit and started to panic. Seeing McFadden struggling, Maine acted quickly. He grabbed McFadden's legs, trying to help stabilize his buoyancy. Despite their efforts, when they finally stopped moving upwards, they found themselves 80 feet higher in the bell ceiling of the fifth room. The buoyancy was still off, causing them more trouble. Gavin checked his air gauge and saw it was down to 1,000 PSI. Normally, this would be enough for one person to make it back to the decompression tanks, which were 700 feet away, using the DPV for propulsion. However, with both Gavin and McFadden sharing this air, and McFadden feeling stressed and breathing heavily, Gavin knew they were in serious trouble. They didn't have enough air to safely reach the tanks together. Maine tried to convince McFadden to share air with him instead of holding onto Gavin's manifold, but McFadden was too stressed to let go. 
They were running out of time, so Gavin started the DPV and sped towards the fourth room, pulling McFadden with him. Maine helped by holding McFadden's legs to move faster. They successfully passed through the fourth room and then the third, all the while using their remaining air carefully. It wasn't an easy journey. McFadden's buoyancy was still unstable and he was feeling stressed. Despite this, they were making decent progress towards the decompression tanks. They opted for a shortcut into the second room and then passed through the duck under from the second room to the first. However, McFadden lost control of his dry suit again, causing them to suddenly ascend from 100 feet to 60 feet. At this critical moment, Maine realized he could use his knife to cut McFadden's suit and release the trapped air, which would reduce his buoyancy. Then, Gavin and Maine could pull McFadden to safety. But this plan had risks. If they managed to execute it, they might save McFadden. However, there was a chance McFadden could panic when he felt the rush of cold water from his suit being cut. This reaction could be fatal for McFadden, and it might endanger Gavin if McFadden didn't release him. So Maine decided not to cut McFadden's suit and keep trying to help McFadden reach the exit. However, he knew that getting everyone through the two upcoming narrow passages would be incredibly difficult. Despite the challenges, they pressed forward, determined to reach the decompression tanks. They navigated through the cave, making their way to the balcony, and then through the low Bing plane just before encountering the first narrow passage. As they approached, Gavin started to notice that his regulator was becoming harder to breathe through. His air was running out. Gavin started thinking fast. He thought about how strange it would be to come so close to reaching the exit only to drown. The situation was intense as they faced this important moment on their way to safety. McFadden started using Maine's long air hose, leaving Gavin with no air at all. Now, both Gavin and McFadden were without any air left, and Maine was the only one with an air supply. Gavin's lungs felt like they were on fire as he realized McFadden was breathing from Maine's hose, and Maine only had one regulator. Maine took charge of the situation calmly. He saw Gavin struggling and quickly gave him the regulator. Gavin took three deep breaths, thinking they might be his last. He felt numb from lack of air, stressed, and couldn't think clearly. He had come so close to the exit, but now felt resigned to death. Suddenly, Gavin felt a release of pressure. McFadden had let go of Maine's hose. Gavin looked over and saw that McFadden was unconscious and drifting away. He realized McFadden had died. Gavin was still not fully aware and felt like he might not make it. Maine pulled Gavin through the narrow passage, sharing the breathing equipment. Gavin slowly started to wake up and think more clearly as they went on. They finally reached the tanks with decompression and oxygen just in time. They began the lengthy process of decompression, knowing their friend Bill McFadden had passed away moments earlier and his body was right below them. An autopsy later found that Bill McFadden had decompression sickness, where nitrogen gas bubbles form in the body's tissues or bloodstream during rapid ascent. This happened multiple times during their dive. These bubbles can travel to the brain, heart, or lungs, causing serious harm and ultimately death. Bill McFadden had extensive diving experience with a lot dives in Little Dismal, including deep dives. He also explored Cheryl Sink and Sullivan Sink. Despite his skill and experience, this particular dive was very challenging. It's a reminder that even experienced divers can face unexpected dangers in deep waters. No diver truly knows how they'll react in an emergency at great depths until it happens to them. Sadly, this dive ended in tragedy. In the end, the daring mission to map Little Dismal Sink turned into a tragic tale of survival and loss. Despite their experience and bravery, the three divers faced unexpected dangers that led to a heartbreaking outcome. The story of Bill McFadden's tragic death serves as a powerful reminder of the risks and uncertainties that come with exploring the unknown. Thank you for watching. If you found this story interesting, please like, share, and subscribe for more gripping tales from the depths. Don't forget to hit the notification bell so you never miss an update. Stay safe and keep exploring.